Hey everybody, we're picking back up in Exodus chapter 10 today as we're getting through these plagues in Scripture in preparation for the Passover, which is celebrated. And uh, when the Jewish people then celebrate that, they've celebrated it for a long, long time, for hundreds, hundreds of years, and even a few thousand years. And when they celebrated it, um, what we're studying right here leading up to the Passover ties in with the New Testament. When we celebrate Good Friday, when we celebrate that our Lord and Savior went to the cross for us, it all ties in with what we see right here. So in Exodus chapter 10, we're going to look at the plague of the locusts, plague number 8, and plague number 9, the darkness. And, and there's an interesting thing about this darkness. It is a, a darkness that God is going to say is a felt darkness. So dark, so uh, overshadowing the land of Egypt that they can feel it. This is this is certainly a different type of darkness than we're probably accustomed to, like with the darkness of night. So let's pick up now in Exodus chapter 10 and verse 1, and let's see about this plague of the locusts, which are kind of like a grasshopper-like creature, but they devour everything. They are a blight to farmers' fields. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go in to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson. Okay, so there is a perpetuation through the generations that the Israelites are supposed to tell their kids and their grandkids. In the hearing of your son and your grandson, how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Verse 3, So Moses and Aaron went in to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews. And just a little shameless plug right now, 7 o'clock tonight on uh, EBC DeSoto, we are going to do our Hebrews Bible study lesson 2. So tune into that, be part of our live study there. I am the Lord God of the Hebrews. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. The message is very, very clear here throughout Exodus. God continues to speak to Israel and to, uh, to excuse me, Egypt and to Pharaoh saying, humble yourselves. These judgments are coming. Humble yourselves. Repent. Repent. They won't do it though. Verse 4. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country. Again, God's mercy. He's given them some time to repent, to turn. But if they don't, tomorrow the judgment is coming. Verse 5, And they shall cover the face of the land, so that no one can see the land. That's a lot of these bugs. And they shall eat what is left to you after the hail. And they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field, and shall fill all your houses, and all the houses of your servants, and of all the Egyptians, as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day they came on the earth to this day. Then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Verse 7, And Pharaoh's servants said to, to him, say to Moses, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? Look at what the Egyptians are saying to Pharaoh. They're saying, basically, are you nuts? You're our king, but are you crazy? This is the judgment of the one true God. Why won't you just let the Hebrews go? Verse 8. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. And he said to them, Go, serve the Lord your God. But which ones are to go? Again, Pharaoh tries to control the situation. Which ones of you are going to go? I can't let you all go, but who, who is exactly going to go? Verse 9, Moses said, We will go with our strong, uh, excuse me, with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and our daughters and our flocks and our herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. But he, that's Pharaoh, said to them, the Lord be with you, if ever I let you and your little ones go. Look, you have some evil purpose in mind. No, go the men among you and serve the Lord, for that is what you were at, are asking. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Just let the men go. No, you can't take your wives. You can't take the stuff. Again, Pharaoh's temptation is to the children of Israel and to Moses and Aaron. Why not just compromise? 
Pharaoh is still trying to control, refusing to humble himself. He's trying to do business with God, really, on his own terms. It doesn't turn out very well. Verse 12, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, so that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant of the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. Such a dense swarm of locusts as has never been before, nor will it ever be again. They covered their face of the whole land so that the whole land was darkened, and they ate all the plants in the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. No, not a green thing remained, neither tree nor plant of the field, through all the land of Egypt. Verse 16. Then Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Again, he, he has a half-hearted repentance here. We're going to see he's not sincere once again. Please, only this once, plead with the Lord your God only to remove this death from me. Wait a second here. Wait a second. Every single time, Pharaoh says, just pray to God this time. Just pray to God. And just this one time. He continues to resist humbling himself before God. He continues to resist repenting. Let's go on to verse 18 of chapter 10. So he went out from Pharaoh and pleaded with the Lord. Moses goes out, he intercedes. And the Lord turned the wind into a very strong west wind, which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go. We see that the locusts come. They devour everything that's left. We know what a desert looks like. And Egypt along the Nile River was a very lush area. But now, all of Egypt looks like a barren desert. They have lost everything. The only food that they must have left is in their, their storehouses, their food banks, if you will, in the cities. They have nothing else growing. They have very few animals left. Most of those have died out, except for the ones that the God-fearing Egyptians, the ones who are fearing God and His awesome power during these displays of His power, that did hide their animals. They don't have a lot. The entire economy and entire country of Egypt has been brought to its knees, and Pharaoh continues to resist. I just want to read once again verse 7 that we read a few minutes ago. Then Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long shall this man, talking to Mo, about Moses, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not understand that Egypt is ruined? Pharaoh resists. We go on to verse 21. Moving from the eighth plague of the locusts, we now move into the ninth plague. There's only ten plagues. We'll see the other one next time. But... The ninth plague is darkness. And, and what the Bible says about this darkness is it is a felt darkness. This isn't like going out in, in the dark of night. The, the best way I can imagine this is if you're in a, a dark building. There's no exit signs. There's no little light radiating from some exit. You're like in the deep darkness of a basement. You ever been there? The lights have gone out. It's almost like you can feel the darkness. And that probably doesn't even scratch the surface of what this darkness was like. But let's look what God says here. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heavens, and there was pitch darkness in the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, Nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. Notice this though. But all the people of Israel had light where they lived. Then Moses called, then Pharaoh called Moses and said, Go serve the Lord. Your little ones may also go with you. Only leave your flocks and herds behind. Again, Pharaoh trying to control it. Yeah, you can go, but you can't go as God's calling you. Again, a temptation to compromise. Let's see what Moses does. Verse 25, But Moses said, You must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings. 
that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also must go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for we must take of them to serve the Lord our God. And we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. Now, this is a powerful, powerful principle, brothers and sisters, for us. And that is that we go at times in our Christian lives. At times God calls us to go and we don't know where we're going to go. I'm reminded of what we've seen back in Genesis. We saw that the Lord called Abraham to leave Ur, to, to leave his family and his kindred there in Haran, to go and follow the Lord. And the Bible specifically says that Abraham leaves, Abram at that time is his name, he leaves not knowing where he goes. The Lord directs him each step of the way. And so he goes and he begins to not know where are we going to serve the Lord. It reminds me of Abraham. We do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. The Lord is going to lead them every step of the way. Then verse 27, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, said to Moses, Get away from me, take care never to see my face again, for on the day that you see my face you shall die. Again, Pharaoh's anger, Pharaoh's irateness, his refusal to humble himself and repent before Almighty God. Pharaoh attacks the people of God. He attacks Moses, gives him a death threat. And in verse 29, Moses said, As you say, I will not see your face again. And so we conclude today in this video looking at, at plague 8 of the locusts, devouring everything, all their security, all their economy, all their agriculture gone. And then verse 21 on, the ninth plague of darkness. A darkness that can be felt, pitch blackness, people don't even rise from their place for three days. Incredible judgment. And yet, the nation refuses to repent. The application for us viewing today is, are we like Moses and the children of Israel, God's people, saying, no, we're going to serve God and make no compromises, obeying Him completely as He has guided us? Or are we like Pharaoh, hardening our hearts, refusing to humble ourselves before Almighty God, who is sovereign? Do we refuse to repent? If you are hardening your heart, I pray right now that your heart would be softened. May you realize that God is the one in charge. Just like verse 7, when Pharaoh's servants, his servants recognize what's going on. They said to Pharaoh, How long will this man, talking about Moses, be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not understand that Egypt is ruined? We're ruined as a nation, King Pharaoh. Why won't you let them go? It's really simple. Let the slaves go. But Pharaoh refuses to repent. Don't push him away. Don't continue to push away. I'm reminded of this darkness here, an application of it. If you reject the Lord, you reject His call, His good and gracious call to have new life and salvation in Jesus Christ, if you reject Him, the Bible says that you will end up spending eternity in hell in a darkness and a pain and a torture forever. That's not what God desires. The Bible says He desires that not anyone would perish, but that all would come to eternal life in Jesus Christ, His Son. But it tells us in John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, verse 17 and on, we usually don't memorize. Verse 16, that classic passage, God so loves the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. But it goes on to say, as you go on in that passage, but those who do not believe in the name of the Son of God condemn themselves. And their condemnation is reserved forever. If you choose not to believe in Jesus, the good and gracious offer of God for salvation, His desire for you to be saved, will not be yours unless you surrender all. You see, God is a good God. He is not a controlling, fatalistic freak. He does not force people to believe in Him. He calls upon you to make the choice, but you, dear viewer, are not free from the consequences of your choice. 
with everything within me, Facebook friends. I want to extend to you the call. Do not act. Do not respond like Pharaoh. Do not make his choice, I pray. Make the choice that Moses and Aaron made to serve the Lord only. Don't resist him. Don't harden your heart today, for right now is the day of salvation. Don't push off any longer. Surrender to him right now. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who went to the cross to die in your place for your sin. He paid the price so that you can be forgiven if you only believe. You don't have to do anything. You just yield and surrender your life to Him. You give up doing life without God and com completely confess that you are a sinner in need of a Savior and receive His free gift of eternal life. Make Jesus the Lord of your life. Surrender all. Hold nothing back. It's simple. It's just not easy. But I pray that you will surrender all. Father, thank you for your word as we've looked at it today. May hearts be drawn to you. May you honor your word as you have promised in Isaiah 55, that your word will not return unto you void, but will accomplish the purposes for which you have sent it forth. Father, draw hearts to you. Give us an urgency about the gospel. In your name I pray.